Well, good morning, everyone. So we continue our journey through the book of Galatians. But before we get into it, let's commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, it is our prayer that, that you would reveal to us the truth of your word, to reveal to us the truth of your gospel. Father, I just pray that as I speak this morning, that you would bless the words that you have prepared for me. And Father, I just pray that you would prepare the hearts of those who are here this morning, that you may speak to those who need to hear it. Father, we pray all these things through your Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So yes, we've been traveling through Galatians for the last two Sundays, and uh, we've come across the reason for Paul writing his letter to the Galatians, that the Galatian churches have been bewitched. They've abandoned the perfect work of salvation, as is written in verse 6 of chapter 1. They're being taught by people who have been lovingly dubbed Judaizers. They're being taught an incorrect gospel, that grace with works is required for salvation, that without works, you cannot be saved. This is a distortion, and it is a half-truth. Whilst works are a sign that you have been saved, they are not necessary for being saved. You cannot work your way into heaven. These Judaizers have come after Paul has spread the gospel throughout the Gentile nations. They are like tares sown amongst the wheat to destroy the true gospel message. And we read of that in Matthew 13. But what are these works? What are these works that these Jewish brothers are saying are required for salvation? Well, these are Jewish rituals, traditions, and laws. Things like keeping of kosher, keeping of Shabbat, or Sabbath, for those of us who know that name. Keeping of Jewish festivals, and most contentious of all, circumcision. But why is this a problem? Well, much in the same way as we read from Matthew 13 and the uh, parable of the tares, this false message has confused the Galatian church. It is a wrong message because only God alone can save, not any human effort. Grace alone is necessary for salvation. And what's worse, these Christians in the Galatian church have been confused. They are now ineffectual in the way that they transmit the gospel to those around them. Where there was clarity, there is confusion. Where there was priority of the message of salvation through grace, there is now diminishment of the perfect work of Jesus Christ. It is an erroneous message. And it means that they are unable to proclaim accurately the saving grace on offer to those who do not know him. Last week we saw that Paul has laid out his credentials and more importantly, the authority of the gospel that he is teaching. In Galatians 1, 1 to 2, we saw that not, this is not from men, but it is from God. It is not a man-made myth, but it is the truth from God. In Galatians 1, 9 and 10, we read that God's approval is all that matters, especially to Paul. It is God we need to be right with, not man. So we should not seek the approval of men. Paul goes on to give witness to his past as an illustration of the authority that this gospel message has. He speaks of how he received a revelation from Jesus. Now, this is initially on the Damascus Road, which we read of in Acts 9 where he is confronted in quite an astonishing way, where the risen Jesus meets him in person, blinds him, and tells him that he is persecuting Jesus himself. What a confronting message. 
But secondly, he spends three years in the desert, in the Arabian desert. Now, there is much speculation as to what he's doing over this time, and frankly, the scripture doesn't actually tell us. But it is the common consensus that Paul spent that time in solitary contemplation with his Lord Jesus, learning the gospel, making sure that he had it correct, going through scripture, learning from God himself. It is after this time that he goes up to Jerusalem. And this is only briefly for a short stint of 15 days. He visits Peter and James to encourage them, to let them know of the change in his heart. And initially, as we will see in a little moment's time, he wasn't welcomed by them because they were afraid of what he was. But in learning of what he has become through the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, they praise God. Paul continues his justification in the second chapter by recalling the council of Jerusalem and his return to Jerusalem after 14, 14 years. Yes, I got that number right. Paul wants the Galatian church to know that the gospel that he is preaching is firstly given to him by God the Son, which we read in verse 11 of chapter 1. But secondly, he also wants them to know that if this is not enough for you, it has also been confirmed by the pillar disciples in the Jerusalem church. These disciples are James the Elder, who is the half-brother of Jesus, Peter, the rock, whose faith expression would be the foundation for the church across the ages. And John, the apostle who was closest to Jesus. So if anyone was to know what the gospel was truly about and how one is to be saved, these three should definitely know it. We'll start our reading in Galatians 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who had slept slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Jesus Christ so that they might bring us into slavery. To them, we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seemed influential, what they are makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, whom seemed influential, added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been trusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he worked through Peter, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas, that's Peter, and John, who seemed to be the pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles, and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. In verse 1, we see that after 14 years of preaching, north of Jerusalem. He returns to Jerusalem. And he returns with Barnabas and Titus. Now Barnabas, Barnabas was the guy who introduced him to the three original, well, two apostles. 
in James and Peter when he went for that first visit. And we read of this encounter in Acts 9, 26 and 28. Barnabas is known as the son of encouragement. That's literally what Barnabas means. And it is no mistake that the Lord God has chosen this man to accompany Paul on his way back to Jerusalem. Additionally, Titus. Titus is a young man who is led to faith by Paul. He is like a son to Paul in the faith, learning from him what he can. In Titus 1 and 4, we read this. He's a faithful servant to the Lord and a dedicated aid to Paul. And later, he becomes a partner and fellow worker, as we read in 2 Corinthians 8.23. By the way, if you guys want these verses, I do have some notes and I can print them out for anyone who wants them. I know I'm going a little bit fast. Titus is to be a witness as to what the saving grace of the gospel of salvation has done in his life and is doing in the Gentile lives. They were sent, as we read in verse 2 and 6 and 9, they were sent and appointed by God to go to Jerusalem via revelation. Again, this is not from men's doing. This is from God. God wants to sort this situation out. Because God is incredibly interested in us. He wants us to be right with him. He does not care for the rules of men. He cares for the salvation of men. Paul lays down the gospel that he has been preaching to the Gentiles. Salvation by grace coming to the Gentiles. He sets before the apostles, James, John, and Peter, what has been going on. He gives witness, and he shows the example of Titus. But make no mistake, he's not seeking the approval of these men. No, if anything, he is seeking to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, which we read in Ephesians 4, 3. He is looking for unity. He is looking for unity in message so that it doesn't matter which Christian you come across, the gospel message is still the same. Now, I'm going to change where we're reading from here. I'm going to move across to Acts 15. Because Acts 15 is the council of Jerusalem, which, which is what Paul is talking about. Because as soon as he arrives, it seems, the Judaizers have followed him. So in Acts 15, we'll pick up from verse 5. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them, them being the Gentiles, and to order them to keep the law of Moses. If we backtrack just to verse 1, we see that they have already proclaimed that unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. You must do. You must be. You must. These Jewish brothers are convinced that you must follow the law of Moses and be circumcised to be saved. They are convinced that Gentiles like you and me need to be converted to be Jewish, to need to become Jewish in right, in deed, in law. The elders gathered together in verse 6. As the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter, and after there was much debate, 
and I dare say it was heated debate between Paul, Titus, Barnabas, and the Jew Jewish brothers. Peter gives an address in verse 7 and 9. Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them having cleansed their hearts by faith. Anyone know what he's talking about here? This is the account in Acts 10, where Cornelius and his entire house, without any outreach from the apostles, have been following the Lord and seeking him and were given a revelation to look for Peter. And Peter himself was given a revelation, the vision of a sheet coming down, and on it were many items to eat, some clean by kosher law, and others definitely not clean. And the Lord God says to him, take and eat. To which Peter's just like, but, but I'm a Jew, I can't do this. And the Lord God replies, do not call unclean what I have made clean. That is to say, go to the Gentiles. I made them clean. They need your discipling. Peter then ministers to Cornelius and his entire household. And then something which absolutely astonishes Peter happens. The Holy Spirit comes down on Gentiles. In fact, it says even on Gentiles receiving the Holy Spirit. This is how shocked Peter is. And even Luke, as he recounts it later on, that the gospel has come to them. Salvation has come to them. They didn't need to perform any rites. They didn't have to perform any traditions. God sought them out. And we see this today in our world where Muslim brothers and sisters are being called out by visions of the Lord Jesus. Who will go to them? God has made no distinction, which we see in verse 9. God doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to God who you are. It matters that you come to him in repentance. And that is what has happened to Cornelius. And that is what has happened to the Jewish brothers and to Titus. Well, needs to happen to the Jewish brothers. They have been saved by grace through faith, which is not anything that they have done that they should boast. He goes on in verse 10 of Acts 15. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? The purpose of the law is to show you that you cannot keep up to God's standards. It cannot save you. It shows you that you need salvation. It is only Jesus' perfect work on the cross which is able to save you. And Peter is very well aware of this. But he goes on in verse 11, he says, but we believe that we will be saved through grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. In verse 12, Paul and Barnabas now have the floor. All have fallen silent. 
they lay out the gospel that they have been preaching, that it is only the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ which is necessary for salvation. Titus is then brought forward in front of everyone and his life testimony is put on display. Finally, James stands up and gives the ruling of the council, which firstly starts with Titus not being forced to be circumcised. And we read this back in, uh, back in Galatians. But down in verse 13, through 21, and I might actually skip forward a little bit to verse 19. That's all right, Richard. Therefore, my judgment is that you should not trouble these, those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but you should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled and from blood. From ancient generations, Moses has had, has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read on the Sabbath in synagogues. Because works are not necessary for salvation, it does not mean that you can act immorally. In fact, if you love the Lord Jesus and you have accepted the salvation that he has freely offered, as a result, you should be continuing to live morally as an outworking of your faith. You should remember the poor, as I said in Galatians. You should abstain from these things which are immoral in the sight of God. Because if you truly love the Lord God, if you truly have accepted his sacrifice on your behalf, why would you want to add to his suffering on the cross? You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And secondly, you should love your neighbor as yourself. This is the very command that Jesus gave in Matthew 12, 30 and 31. The Jew and the Gentile are saved by grace through faith in God. This is one gospel, both to the Jew and to the Gentile. There is no separate dispensation to both, to each, but one for both. God only cares that you return to him. That you put your trust in him. This is the freedom of the gospel. The weight of the law and the traditions and the rights and the expectations and consequences have been lifted from our shoulders. And they are on the shoulders of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has completed all that is expected of us. Because if we focus on these laws and traditions and these rights and these expectations and, and the consequences of them, we no longer are focusing on the Lord God. We're focusing on ourselves. We are to remember that we are slaves to Christ alone. Where once we were slaves to sin, we are now slave to, to Christ alone and to the love of our God. And it is a joyous slavery.
back in verse 4 of Galatians 2, we have rather a scathing remark from Paul about these brothers, which serves to highlight how passionately he feels about the misrepresentation of the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation which is offered by him. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery. Now, whether or not they meant this, I cannot say, but I can tell you this much. Satan wants to bring us back into slavery. He wants us ineffectual. He wants us dwelling on ourselves. He wants us focused on law keeping, focused on our ineptitude, our inability to keep the law instead of focused on the Lord God. But we have this counter in Romans 8. One to three. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by flesh could not do. Jesus has done what we in our weak flesh form could not do. He's kept the law. And he is paid for our sins. We are free from the law of sin and death. Why would we want to go back to that slave master? God has done this on our behalf. We couldn't do it ourselves. Don't go back. Follow Christ, not the law. The law has been completed in Christ. Do not yield, just as we read in verse 5, that Paul and Barnabas did not yield to this teaching, which was being given to them by the Jewish brothers. They did not back down from the defense of the gospel. Maintain the clarity and accuracy of the gospel. The accuracy of the gospel affects the effectiveness of the believer. It affects how we are able to proclaim the good news. And it also affects our ability to live in right relationship with the Lord God. We are to reject false gospels of works. Once again, I've said it once, I'll say it again, works cannot save you. Faith must come first, and faith only comes from God. We read in the second half of our passage that Paul is entrusted to bring the gospel to the Gentiles from verses 7 through to 9. He was entrusted first by the Lord Jesus Christ to do so. And he started off in Damascus and was nearly killed for it. He was confirmed later at the council in Jerusalem by the pillar apostles. And this is a heritage which is passed along through Barnabas, John Mark, Silas, Apollos, Timothy, and Titus to bring the gospel of salvation to the Gentiles and without which we would not be sitting here today. I would not be standing here today. Praise the Lord that he kept to that gospel. And this message is the same as what it was back then as it is today. We see that in Paul's life in the first book that he writes, Galatians, that he's dedicated to the true defense, to upholding its priority, clarity, and accurate proclamation of the gospel 
of salvation through grace. And we see it also in his final book, in 2 Timothy, where he's handing over the reins to Timothy to carry on the tradition. He's passing on the defense of the gospel. And he trusts God to keep that gospel throughout the ages. He says in verse 14, of chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, to Timothy, he says, guard this treasure entrusted to you. And can I say that to each and every one of us here today? Guard the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Stand up for the gospel. Rebuke the wrong gospel that is being preached today. Because there are two messages of salvation which are being told in the world today. The first message says that if you want to be right with God, to avoid punishment for your sin, to become enlightened, to be reborn into a better life, you must follow laws, complete rites, keep traditions, act morally. That you must do something. You must be something. To have even a chance of being saved or being absolved of your sin, enlightened or freed from this life of suffering. It is the message that says that only a select few who tick the box can achieve this and be worthy of this. It is a message that sets God as a condemner and nothing else. Where God remains distant, apathetic, or even malevolent to your state. And sets us to do the impossible. It is the message that sets us up for failure. And this message is the devil's counterfeit salvation. It is a half-truth. It is hopeless. This is the message from the world. And you see it in every world religion. It is a lie. But there is a second message. And this message comes from God himself. It says that what is impossible for us is possible for God. It is the message that is only found in God's son. And it is the truth. Just as the one who brought it to us, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the truth. It is the message of true salvation. It is the message that is the good news. It is the good news that the Lord Jesus Christ has paid our sin debt by his death on the cross and as evidence that that death was, is, and always will be enough, God raised him from the dead. It is the good news that every law, tradition, rite, ritual, and expectation that was once on you has been completed and met by the Lord Jesus Christ. And you need only put your trust in him to be saved. It is the good news that the one and only true and living God will forgive, reconcile, and save those who put their trust in Jesus Christ the Son. And I'll leave you with this final verse. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Are you part of the world? That is you.